morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I had the opportunity to go to Publix. That's not a big deal to some of you. But for someone who grew up here and has lived abroad for some time, that was a, a big deal. I mean, my mother works in Publix. And um, a few days ago, I was able to go down to Publix, and I was uh, getting some food for the house. And uh, I walked into the store, not having been there in a while. My wife does a good portion of the shopping with me back home, but here I was on my own. And uh, I go down to the cereal aisle, and I was going to buy a box of cereal. Uh, as I get down the aisle, I am looking at what to buy, and... I was baffled at all of the different op options for cereal, on which cereal to choose from. Usually we get what the kids like, and it's as simple as that, but uh, I have some of the different options you could buy from Publix. You could buy uh, Kellogg's cereal. They have a Kellogg's Vanilla Crunch cereal. They have Quaker Oats cereals. They have a, a brand called Cheerios. And, uh, there's a, a large variety of Cheerios to choose from. They have Apple Cinnamon Cheerios, Berry Burst Cheerios, Cheerios Protein Cereal, Cinnamon Cheerios, Cinnamon Burst Protein Cheerios, Cinnamon Nut Cheerios, Chocolate Cheerios, Chocolate Peanut Butter Cheerios, Frosted Cheerios, Fruity Cheerios, Honey Nut Cheerios, Millennial Cheerios, Multi-Grain Cheerios, Multi-Grain Dark Crunch Cheerios, Multi-Grain Peanut Butter Crunch Cheerios, Oak Cluster Cheerios, Pumpkin Spice Cheerios, that's a good one, Strawberry Cheerios, Very Berry Cheerios, Yogurt Burst Cheerios, we haven't gotten into Kex, Chex, excuse me, just yet, you can have Chocolate Chex. Cinnamon checks, corn checks, double checks, frosty mini checks, honey graham checks, honey nut checks, multi brand checks, rice checks, strawberry checks, sugar checks. You, <laughs> that's just two brands of, of cereal to choose from. I finally picked the Publix brand because price makes a difference, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and I turned the aisle and uh, I was going to get some sauce and I go down to the, the aisle and I wanted to buy some, some mustard. <laughs> And would you know, there you are standing at the aisle looking at the mustard. You have the variety of mustards that you could buy over there at Publix is incredible. You can buy Dijon mustard. Sorry. You can buy uh, simple, just the classic yellow mustard. There's uh, whole, grain, uh, whole grain mustard. Uh, and there, finally, I found the, the honey Dijon mustard, which is the one I usually would buy. Uh, but uh, shall I move on? Uh, no, we, we can go all throughout the choices, all of these different choices that we make. Last week, we were looking uh, in the story of uh, Jacob and Esau, and we saw from, their, from that story, from that passage, that there are choices that all of us make in life, choices that uh, impact the our lives sometimes in ways that can never be changed. Uh, some decisions you make are so important in life, but of all the decisions you have in life to make, there is one decision, there, uh, I believe that there is one choice that you make that is going to have an impact on pretty much the direction of everything else in your life. And what you do with this choice is really going to determine where you stand in pretty much every area of your life. In Luke 12, we were uh, talking, uh, I think it was last week, about um, the, the thing that you value most in life is how God is going to measure you in the end. And we talked about a chariot wheel. And, how uh, whatever you put at the center of your life is going to be the very heart of that wheel. And all the spokes point to that. And that will determine what happens in the rest of your life. Well, I believe the most important choice that anyone can make in life is what God you're going to serve. Because the, the God that you choose to serve in your life really takes predominance over everything, doesn't it? America today is... Uh, has a God that they serve. Uh, they're so engrossed in Hollywood. We, we love sports in America. We play, uh, we like to uh, idolize a lot of uh, the different sports players, young people. Do they become kind of a, 
what they want to be when they grow up. And, but that's not the a God America serves today. Those are uh, some things that are idols in our country. But what uh, the, the God that America serves today is the all-knowing God of self. Uh, someone once called it the God of meism. There's different ways you can uh, worship God or worship the God of meism. There's different uh, labels for it. Now we call it self-identity, the right to choose, authenticity. Uh, we sometimes tolerance. Uh, there's all kinds of ways. Some people like to worship Buddha. You know, that's, a, that's their form of meism. Atheism is probably the the most predominant form of meism today. I don't. There is no God. I, I determine my own fate. At least you think you do. I'm in charge of my life. You know, I control things. That's the perspective that so many uh, in this world have today, and they mock Christians because we don't worship that God. We worship a different God. Uh, we worship the God of the Bible, and so because of that, we're uh, we're, we're we're the narrow-minded people, right? We're we're the people that have all of the of all of the problems in our society. We're, we're what's wrong with America today because we're so narrow-minded. <clears throat> we're mocked and ridiculed for this. We're, we're fanatics because we, we actually believe this book is true. The question is, are we right to believe all that? Um, could we have made the wrong choice? I mean, I mean how do we know that that the God that we serve is, is, the, is the true God. How do we know that this book is right and that our God is alive today? Well, that's the, that's the question that the passage we're looking at this morning really deals with. Who is the God of heaven and earth? In our passage this morning that we're going to be looking at, we're, in, we're, we're dealing with a very rebellious king in the nation of Israel. He, he might have been the worst king Israel ever had before. He has become to worship a god uh, of, of another nation. Not only this, this king that we're looking at today, that we're, we're introduced to, he sets up an altar for this god in his new capital of the northern, of northern Israel. He builds a temple to this god, and he begins to worship it. Why? Because he thinks, he believes that this god is the god that's in control of rain. He's the god that can control everything. He controls the fate of the land. At least that's what he thinks. And so, as he worships this Canaanite god, this king begins to arouse the anger of the god of Israel. And more than that, he has aroused him, and he becomes known as the king that has aroused God's anger, and he's done worse than any other kings before him. If you have your Bibles, open up with me to the book of 1 Kings. We're in 1 Kings 17 this morning. 1 Kings chapter 17. Up to this point, Ahab had been had made some terrible choices in choosing to serve the god of, of the Sidonians. His wife, Jezebel, was from Sidon. He worships the god Baal. And so because of this, he's aroused the anger of the Lord. And in response to the choices that Ahab makes, God sends him a prophet. This is the first passage we're introduced to, the man that's going to become known as uh, Elijah, and then later his successor, Elisha. These men challenge Ahab's uh, position, his beliefs, and they challenge the rebellion. And <clears throat> their, uh, Elijah's desire here is to remind Israel the greatness of the Lord and the power of God. And so here in 1 Kings 17, um, we begin reading in verse number 1. Elijah's going to make a very, very bold claim to King Ahab. And he's going he's gonna to say several things here. He says in, in chapter 17, verse 1, he says, And the Elijah the Tishpite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew, nor rain these years, but according to my word 
the name Elijah is really pretty fitting for him, actually. Because Elijah is uh, claiming to be standing before the Lord here. His name means Jehovah is my God. You remember Jesus on the cross when he is crying out to the Lord, uh, Eli, Eli, L E, my God, Eli, my God. And then the ending of his name, Yah or Jah, for Jehovah. Jehovah is my God. And so as Elijah comes up here, his very name is going to stand against everything Ahab is trying to do with the nation of Israel. He claims that God, not Baal, is alive. He says to King Ahab that as the Lord God lives. But he says something else. He says, I stand before him. He says, I am his spokesperson. I am his prophet. And then he says this. He claims that God, that God, Jehovah, the God of Israel, not the God of Baal, is in control of the weather. He says that be, according to the word of the Lord, there will not be any rain. There's not going to be any dew for three full years. And through this verse here, he you understand what he's claiming. He's claiming that Jehovah, God, is in control of the life and the death of the Lamb. It's not the God of Baal. It's not uh, the God Moat, which some of them had served. And so that's a pretty bold claim. It's a pretty uh, powerful statement to, for a prophet to walk up to the king of Israel and to make such a statement. The question is, can he back it up? So he's made a pretty uh, powerful uh, accusation against Baal. He said he's not alive. <laughs> and you're going to, later on, you'll even see how he mocks him. But the question is, can, can he back it up? I think he can. He said, in verse 17, and if you want to know, we're not teaching on specifically on the, the word of the Lord today, but notice as we go throughout this story how the, the word of God is just woven throughout this entire chapter. We might not mention that again, so do pay attention to it. It's actually kind of neat. And the word of the Lord came unto him, unto Elijah. God comes to Elijah, and he says here, he commands Elijah to, to leave now, and he sends him over to the brook Cherith, and he promises that when he sends him over there, that he's going to provide for him. He says, Elijah, I'm going to take care of all of your needs. Uh, you just go down there, and you basically stay right here beside the brook. In verse 2, or verse 3, it says, Get thee hence and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank from the brook. Now that's pretty amazing if you think about what's going on. I mean, in America, what we've just read may not seem very spectacular. We're used to what? I mean, a, a steak and a baked potato once or twice a week. I mean, we're, we're used to going over to Publix and being able to pick out all the different cereals that we have uh, options to. But in this day, uh, for some, people didn't have meat every day. We were talking about uh, lamb and how uh, this morning and how it's a delicacy here, but in other parts of the world. Well, meat in general was a delicacy. If you had meat once a week, you were probably a king. I mean, you couldn't just go into the freezer and thaw out a steak for supper. And yet Elijah is fed by the Lord meat and bread morning and night. That's amazing. Uh, so far, so good. Elijah has been provided for. And God proves here, as he sustains Elijah, as he takes care of his prophet, that he has the ability to take care of his people. He shows that God does have power. Uh, God has provided everything Elijah needed. But, you see, this was the land of Israel. This was God's country. I mean, in these days, everyone had a God. Idolatry was prevalent. Uh, gods were pretty much nation to nation, at least. Yeah, that's how, uh, the, that's the ideology of these cultures. Uh, uh, Baal was the God of Sidon, and you've, you've got gods, different Canaanite gods for different countries. Sure, God could take care of him. I mean, after all, this was Israel. This was a God's land. 
And so that is great, but now the story's going to take it a step further. Sure, God could provide for his people in his own country, but can he provide for him somewhere else? God, eventually in verse 7, we read that the brook dries up. But there hasn't been any rain there. That should tell you a little more that God has some control. God uh, said there wouldn't be rain, and there wasn't. The brook dries up, and pretty soon Elijah has no water. And so God tells him, Elijah, uh, arise. In verse 9, he says, arise, I want you to leave now. But it's where he sends him that is so spectacular in this passage. Because he, he, he demonstrates that he has the ability to sustain his people, that he has the power over the land when he takes care of Elijah here. But when now he's going to send him to a place called Zarephath. And Zarephath, uh, if you know your geography of Israel in these days, and that's okay if you don't, but it, it wasn't in Israel. In fact, the irony of the whole situation was that it was actually in sight on the very place where Baal was uh, originated from, the god of the Sidonians. He tells him to go to Zarephath. And he says here, I have commanded, in verse 9, a widow woman to sustain thee. I don't think he could have picked a better person to prove God's ability. Because of all of the people, and Jesus even takes notice of this passage and mentions it to the people in the crowds in the New Testament, that of all of the widows that he could have chosen, he chose this one. So the very fact that it was a woman of Zarephath is a big deal. But think about it. Of all people to provide for Elijah, God chooses a woman. And it, hey, in our culture today, women want their independence. They, they don't want uh, someone else taking care of them. But in this culture, understand, uh, the men took care of their wives. The men provided for them. And so this woman was the one who was going to be providing for Elijah. That was twisted. That was turned all the way upside down in this passage. But beyond that, this woman was a widow. She had no husband. She, she had no sustenance of any kind. She, and as you read through the story, you find that she had absolutely no means of providing for herself, let alone for providing for Elijah. And so we read in, the, in verse 9, Arise, he says, go to Zarephath, which belongeth to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman to sustain thee. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the woman was there gathering of sticks, and he called to her and said, Fetch, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a little morsel of bread in thine hand. And she says, As the Lord your God liveth, thy God liveth, I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise. She said, I have nothing. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, and neither shall the cruse of oil fail until the day the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she, did and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. And she and her house did eat many days. And then in verse 16, the, uh, the biblical writer, the one God has to write this, pauses just for a moment. He just wants to kind of reflect on it. Verse 16, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the core cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Elijah. And God so far has proven that he could sustain Elijah, but now he's done more than that. He demonstrates that his power when he provides for someone who had absolutely no connection to the God of Israel. Uh, she, uh, there's no reason to think that at this point this uh, woman of Zarephath had any faith in the Lord up to now. She calls in the Lord your God. 
And yet when she's willing to obey the word of the Lord here, when, with the word of Elijah, God uses this widow of all people, a widow not of Israel, but a widow of Zarephath, to prove that God is alive and that God is powerful. And so here we see that God can provide from not just the sustenance he, he provides for Elijah, but now how he takes care of this widow. But there's still one more test. Because up to this point, God has proven what? That he can provide for his people. Sure, God can sustain me. He can take care of uh, Israel. God has that ability. But what about when life is lost? I mean, sure, God can take care of those that are alive. But what about when life has been taken away? Here is at the end of the passage, at the end of the story, where God finally proves that without any shadow of a doubt that it's He and it's not Baal is the, who is the one that makes the rules. God has proven that He can take care of life, but now He's going to show that He can do something more. Here in verse 14, I'm sorry, in verse 17, we read that the widow's son soon becomes very sick. And this son becomes so sick that the Bible says that there was no breath left in him. In other words, the child has died. And the woman immediately thinks there's something wrong with her. She knows there's something in her, there's things in her life, and she comes to Elijah and she begins to rebuke him. Uh, what is it that you've done? Why have you uh, brought this thing on me? Is it because of my sin? Is it because of the, the sin that I've com committed in my life that you're bringing this to remembrance to me, she, it says here in verse 17, that it came to pass after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Art thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? And he said unto her, Give me thy son. And he took uh, her son out of her bosom and carried him up into a loft where he had abode, into his room up on the top floor. He takes him upstairs and he lays him upon his own bed. And when he does that, verse 20 says that he cries unto the Lord. And he says, O Lord my God, hast thou also brought evil upon the widow with whom I sojourn by slaying her son? And he stretches out himself upon the child. Uh, he stretches out himself three times. And he cried unto the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's soul come in unto him again. And then verse 22, of course. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. And the soul of the child came into him again. And he revived. And Elijah takes the child and brought him up, down, out of the chamber, into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See thy son liveth. And then verse 22, as the chapter finishes out, look what the last verse says. It says, And the woman said unto Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of God, the word of the Lord in thy mouth, is truth. And so God proves without a shadow of a doubt by raising this widow's son, that he is God and that he is able to not just take care of his people, but he's able to raise the dead. And that, that the God of the Bible is alive. 1 Kings 17 is a great story. Uh, and it's set in the days in this passage of King Ahab in 1 Kings 17. But if you have ever read through the entirety of the books, 1 and 2 Kings, you know that the book ends near the time of captivity. And we don't know exactly when the book is written, but it's suspected and it's very likely that this book was written for those that were sitting in Babylon. Though, because that's right where the story left. Not when they came back, but the book of 2 Kings ends with them in Babylon. And so as you read this story and you imagine... Uh, the captives sitting there in Babylon with the Babylonian gods and reading this story in 1 Kings, discouraged, thinking that all hope has been lost, that there is no future for their people. They're reminded in 1 Kings 17 that their God has not failed them, 
they're reminded that their God is still alive. And that their God is able to sustain not just Elijah, not just this widow, but as they read this story, that their God is the God who controls the life and death of the land, and He can take care of His people, even in Babylon. But beyond that, they learn also through the resurrection of this child that God can restore that which has been lost. And as you read books like the book of Ezekiel, and you go through the story of the dead bones, and as Ezekiel is looking at the, the bones and uh, asking, can these bones live, he's asked. Watching the bones resurrected, knowing that God can restore the nation of Israel. They're reminded of this. We in the New Testament have a much more complete understanding of who God is. And we understand that in Jesus Christ, those that have put their faith in Him have been uh, raised to walk in newness of life. We know from Ephesians 2 that we were dead in our trespasses and sins and that Jesus Christ has raised us up and that we are alive in Him. Jesus says that I am He who was dead and I am alive forevermore. So we know that God is able to restore, to restore life, to raise us up in, and to walk in newness of life. But Paul reminds us even beyond that Paul reminds us in Timothy, he says what? He says, I know whom I have believed. He says, I know whom I believed and I know, but I also know, I know that he is able to keep, to sustain that which I've committed unto him. Not only do I know today as a Christian that God can give you a new life in Jesus Christ, but I know that just as God can provide for Elijah, just as God can provide for a woman who had absolutely no connection, with Israel. God can provide and can sustain me. I know that my soul is in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ and that I am secure in Him. And I know that my God is alive. And with that type of a knowledge, Christian, can I ask you a question? Why would you serve any other God but that? Why serve any God but the God of the Bible? Don't serve America's God. Don't serve uh, the gods of Hollywood. Don't serve the God of self. We live in a culture today that makes fun of people who believe this book, but I promise you something. There's coming a day when we're all going to stand before Him and we're going to be able to say, my God, He's alive. He, Jesus said in Revelation, we said it a moment ago, I was He who was dead, but I'm alive forevermore. I hope that's an encouragement to you. And I hope that as you read stories like this in 1 Kings, that you're reminded that our God is in control. Not the gods of this world, but the God of heaven and earth. Amen. With that, I'm going to turn the service back over to uh, Andrew, to Pastor. Or to, amen. I hope you come back tonight. I'd uh, love to see you this evening. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that. Why would you serve any other God but the true and living God? You know, our God is like no other. I spent the last week. Uh, you're just looking at ancient Greek culture and uh, Roman culture and how that the Romans took the Greek gods, and the Egyptian gods, and put them all in temples and places, and uh, how that in Romanism they took the same gods, really, and worshipped them. And meanwhile, the whole time, every time they're worshipping a god, he is just a deity that represents something that the god, the real true living god, actually is. Why would you serve any god? But Jesus. Well, uh, that's a that's a decision that, uh, or that's a question that calls for an answer to the decision. And I think it comes out two ways for us as believers when it comes to the invitation. First part of the invitation is, have you received Jesus? Jesus is God. This morning at Teen Sunday School, we looked at the witness, the testimony that Jesus made. The Pharisees told him, they said, uh, you testify yourself. Your witness isn't true because in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word will be established. And they're speaking to the triune God. <laughs> a God who is three in one. And who comes from heaven. And the miracles which He did prove who He was. And that's our God. Why would you believe any other God? If you haven't trusted Jesus as your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God will witness to you the truth that Jesus is the only way. And He's the only true living God. The second, the second part of the invitation this morning would probably be practical more so for most of us, and that would be who are you serving?
are you serving? Because it's possible, isn't it? Like the children of Israel, the halt between two opinions. You know, you remember when Elijah came and said, how long halt you between two opinions? And if God, the Lord be God, serve Him. If Baal, then serve Him. They're kind of, eh, you know, I don't want to say God isn't God. I don't want to say Baal isn't God. Uh, I'm not sure which. And the Bible says they answered Him not a word. They didn't say anything. And then Elijah said, let's test them. Let's do a test. Let's run a test to see who God is. And when they ran the test to see who God is, the prophets of Baal are cutting themselves until the blood's running out on the ground. And Baal didn't answer them. And then Elijah prayed and fire came from heaven. That's the God. That's God. is isn't some false God. Who are you serving? Someday we're going to stand before God and we're going to find out that what we lived for, what we served for, was either God or no God. is isn't a God. There's no God and there's no God. And so uh, let's go ahead and, and if you would mind, we're going to have a time of invitation. If Angela will come... Uh, I'd like to just sing this morning, page 235, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. A little different song for the invitation. But if you'd stand, and if God spoke in your heart, you need to respond to the message this morning, either by saying, Pastor Price, I don't know that I know God. I don't know that I know God. But, you know, I'd like to know the real, true, and living God. Uh, let me know during the invitation, either by making eye contact with me. You could even talk to me after the service. And we can make sure that today is the day that the Holy Spirit of God enters your heart. You know the true living God in a personal way. Uh, if you're here this morning and you, and you just would say, you know something, I'm kind of ambiguously serving a God, but it isn't the God. And God showed you that. Well, you'll know exactly what He's told you because His Spirit does not speak generally. He speaks specifically to us. And the invitation would be a time that instead of singing, you just bow your head and do business with God before you sing. So we're going to sing Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior, page 235, and we'll sing the first, the third, and the fourth uh, for our invitation this morning. Mm -hmm.